In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. As a priest, what keeps me up at night, probably more than anything else in this vocation, is whether or not I am faithful to God's voice. God's voice in my preaching, in my writing, in my teaching, and in my leading of this parish. Let me be a bit more specific. Are my teeth for God's justice sharp enough? And am I listening closely enough to discern God's justice from Ben's politics? The gospel never calls us to stand still. It always wants us to get to somewhere different than we are. That truth that God loves us with all God's being, but loves us enough not to let us stay where we are, is true. It calls us to be stretched. They say that the role of the preacher is to comfort the afflicted, but to afflict the comfortable. And sometimes that's difficult to do. Sometimes keeping the peace, keeping people happy, keeping people in the pews seems to rub up against it. Brene Brown, who I spent a lot of time during Holy Week talking about, said that in order to be relevant as a religious leader or a social leader, in order to be relevant in today's age, we have to be addressing the chasm that exists between the people in this community. Our political chasms, our social chasms, between the way that we're throwing rocks across the way at one another, if we don't engage that, if we don't facilitate conversation and break down those divisions, then we will soon be irrelevant. But sometimes I worry that that desire for unity, that desire to build bridges, runs up against that call for justice, for God's justice. Does it come at the expense of God's vision sometimes? I think they both are in tension. That's one of the tensions of being a priest. Our ordination calls us to be the shepherd of the body, to hold the body together, to carry the entire body through difficult parts of our story, parts of our history, but to also point towards the cross, to keep us guided towards our head, which is Christ. Those two axes of responsibility of my calling are often what keep me up at night. Am I sacrificing one for the other? Do they both exist in, in, in the correct tension? I described the cross during Holy Week and Lent and then on Easter Day as that intersection between God's love-soaked vision for the world and the life we live, the world we live in. I think that's where we're called to live, right at that collision point. I think the legacy or the mark of Martin Luther King Jr. was that he lived his public life unflinchingly at that intersection where those two wooden beams crossed between God's dream for the world and the brokenness of the world that we live in. And it would have been so easy to make that intersection between his might and the might of the world, between his indignation and the injustice of the world, but he made that life, that intersection, right at that point that's hard to stay in, between God's dream of this world and what could be and the world we live in. And I think that's why we can't turn away, because he was unflinching. His success and the power that he had was that he didn't cower from the risks of that place, and that he was faithful to the cross. He carried the cross, and it wasn't just the world that we live in and his reaction to it, but it was taking the world that we live in and shining God's vision upon it unflinchingly. His dream was God's dream. It was a dream for all God's children, not just those that he saw disenfranchised. It was a dream for equality. It was a dream for reconciliation. It was a dream for peace, even around the globe. And it was a dream for unity. And it was consistent with all that we know that God deeply desires for each of us. 
And it was steeped in the belief that we are all God's children and in the teaching of today's gospel. That when someone strikes us on the cheek, we turn the other cheek. That we love our enemies as hard as it gets to love them. God's dream is not an eye for an eye, but a world where we can love our enemies until they are no longer so. Until we know them so well and we've intentionally loved them so fully that they can no longer be our enemy but are our brother or our sister. That Christian fundamental truth and the inspiring teaching and example of Gandhi were the pillars of Martin Luther King's prophetic witness. It was a witness that made him the youngest winner of the Nobel Peace Prize in history. And his uh, reward, which at the time uh, was 54000 but would translate into almost half a million dollars today, he gave entirely towards his cause. And I was not born yet on that day on April 4th. But those who were of age know where they were on that day. My parents both could recount clearly where they were on April 4th, 1968, when in Memphis, while there to support striking sanitation workers, he was killed. And why do we acknowledge and dedicate this Sunday to the anniversary of his death and not his, his birth? Because even in his death, that vision could not be quelled. His heavenly vision that shined here continues for him thereafter, but we are called to pick up that mantle and to continue working on that vision that's come so far but isn't done by a long shot. And I can't listen to his speeches and his sermons without the hair standing on the back of my neck. His dream, both the dream taken straight from the words of Isaiah or where he goes off script and describes his hopes for his four children that they be judged not by the color of their skin, but the content of their character, or his descriptions on those red clay hills of Georgia, that there come a day where the son of a slave owner and the son of a former slave could sit at the same table in brotherhood. His vision where black children and white children in Alabama could hold hands and live and acknowledge each other as full brothers and sisters. That vision is God-soaked. It is who God is. Or his sermon, his prescient sermons near the end of his life, where he seemed to know what was going to be the cost of living right at that intersection between those two wooden beams, where he talks about what he once said at his funeral, that he would be regarded as a drum major, not for his own accomplishments, but for what he pointed to, what he was able to direct. Or that final, final speech where he talks about the mountaintop, what it's like to be there and get a glimpse of what's possible, about what's coming, of seeing what God has done in this world, but what God can do beyond that. But even more than his sermons, what really sits with me, what really gnaws at me, what keeps me awake at night as I began my sermon today was around that letter from a Birmingham jail. It makes me ask, what would I have done? I'm a white preacher living in the South. How would I have responded? Would I have chosen the comfort and security of keeping the parish together over justice? How close would I have been willing to live at that intersection between those two beams? How close to that intersection would we be willing to have lived? And in our own age today, where are we living? Just a little bit from his address, from his letter. But more basically, I am in Birmingham because injustice is here. Just as the prophets of the 8th century B.C. left their villages and carried their, thus saith the Lord, far beyond the boundaries of their hometowns. And just as the Apostle Paul left his village in Tarsus and carried the gospel of Jesus Christ to the far corners of the Greco-Roman world, 
so am I compelled to carry the gospel of freedom beyond my own hometown. Like Paul, I must constantly respond to the Macedonian call for aid. He continues, we are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny. Then he goes on to talk to the pastors about our ability to say, you know what, in God's time, this will get worked out. In God's time, all of these injustices will crumble. In God's time, if we just sit still enough, it'll get taken care of. This is what he says about God's time. Frankly, I have yet to engage in a direct action campaign that was well-timed in the view of those who have not suffered unduly from the disease of segregation. For years now, I have heard the word wait. It rings in the ear of every Negro with a piercing familiarity. This wait is almost always meant never. You must come to see with one of our distinguished jurists that justice too long delayed is justice denied. I must make two honest confessions to you, my Christian and Jewish brothers. First, I must confess that over the past few years, I have been gravely disappointed with the white moderate. I've almost reached the regrettable conclusion that the Negro's great stumbling block in his stride towards freedom is not the white citizen's counselor or the Ku Klux Klanner, but the white moderate, who is more devoted to order than to justice, who prefers a negative peace, which is the absence of tension, to a positive peace, which is the presence of justice, who constantly says, I agree with you in the goal you seek, but I cannot agree with your methods of direct action, who paternalistically believes he can set the timetable for another man's freedom. And this line, this line sent shivers through my body. Too many others have been more cautious than courageous and have remained silent behind the anesthetizing security of stained glass windows. Too many others have been more cautious than courageous and have remained silent behind the anesthetizing security of stained glass windows. Yes, these questions are still in my mind. In deep disappointment, I have wept over the laxity of the church but be assured that my tears have been tears of love. There can be no deep disappointment where there is not deep love. Yes, I love the church. How could I do otherwise? I am in the rather unique position of being the son, the grandson, and the great-grandson of preachers. Yes, I see the church as the body of Christ. But oh, how we have blemished and scarred that body through social neglect and through fear of being nonconformists. He concludes his letter from behind those prison bars with this. Hope this letter finds you strong in the faith. I also hope that circumstances will soon make it possible for me to meet each of you, not as an integrationist or civil rights leader, but as a fellow clergyman and a Christian brother. Let us all hope that the dark clouds of racial prejudice will soon pass away and the deep fog of misunderstanding will be lifted from our fear-drenched communities. And then some not too distant tomorrow, the radiant stars of love and brotherhood will shine over our great nation with all their scintillating beauty. Yours for the cause of peace and brotherhood. Martin Luther King, Jr. It's a good thing that those words keep me up at night, that those words make me shudder. It's a good thing that I'm not off the hook for whether or not I preach sharply enough. I pray that those words that I hear, I always hear ring through. That we do seek unity, that we seek understanding, that we seek a place of coming together, that this be a place that you always know you belong and that you always know you can brush off all of the weight of the outside world, but that this is a place of transformation. This is a place that lives at that intersection between those two wooden bars. 
that this is a place of courage, a place moving toward the center of that cross. As we baptize, I pray that we always proclaim and live out of that truth, that we seek and serve Christ and all people, that we respect the dignity of every human being, that we are fixed on God's vision, that we are fixed on that place where God's love drenches our lives and spills into all of the world. Martin Luther King lived to see so much of his vision realized and so much has been realized since his death. But God's vision still takes a lot of workers, a lot of people not too afraid to live right at that intersection. I pray we hear the call and that we are God's people called to that work. Amen.